Yokai, Paper Leaves, A Furry Romance from the Fracture Written and narrated by Michael Palmer Crile Chapter 4 Jex had trudged along the streets of his tiny city. The school day was over and he was on his way to a place that didn't suck out loud. His home. He had absolutely expected the first day back at school to be awful, but not that bad. Honestly, had the universe sucked all of the crappiness from every other corner of itself and ejected it into that friggin' cafeteria? Jexa found himself wishing strongly that every person in that cafeteria that turned their backs on Fred, that insulted her and didn't help her, would get what was coming to them. Consuming a large amount of spoiled shellfish, then having a torrent of something malodorous issue forth from both ends of them, at great speed and volume for an extended period of time should suffice. Jexa closed his eyes tightly when he realised he was forced to include himself on the list of people that deserved punishment. Probably best to avoid shellfish for a while, just in case. He hadn't helped Fred. Not in any way that really mattered. She didn't need a tray of dishes dropped at the right time. She needed someone to be nice to her. And he wasn't. He tried to make himself feel better with the realisation that anything he did would make her life at that school so much worse but it was a small comfort. He kicked at a pebble on the footpath, an attempt to banish the shame he was soaking in from his mind. It didn't help. Not many people knew this, but Jexa had superpowers. Well, a superpower. Just the one, and it was super crappy. Jexa could generate levels of guilt that could choke a rhino. The boy could feel guilty for things he wasn't even loosely associated with and feel atrociously guilty for things that actually were his fault. He could feel so guilty, in fact, that passers-by in the street would often vomit blood just from seeing such overpowering guilt from a distance. Crappy, crappy superpower. Jexa was feeling particularly guilty for not smiling back at Fred in their classroom. She had looked down at him, clearly needing a moment of kindness. Just a smile would have been enough. Instead of giving her that, he had stared down at his desk and ignored her. "'Excuse me, young sir. May I trouble you for a smile, if it pleases you?' Jexa spoke in a vaguely feminine voice and in an accent that was potentially British, though not convincingly so. "'Hell no. I ain't wasting my smiles on the likes of you. Screw you, Bunniscombe!' Jexa's accent changed to that of a rugged manly man, possibly from the Deep South, or Jamaica. It was hard to tell. Jexa hunched his shoulders and made a small eep noise when he realised he was having both sides of a conversation that was using richly unimpressive accents in the middle of a very public footpath in broad daylight. Mercifully, nobody seemed to notice his deeply cringeworthy jaunt into crazy town. He cleared his throat with a small cough and continued on his way. Jexa passed through the good part of town and crossed into the less good part of town, and then into the downright bad part of town. He had lived in this area five years ago, and it had not changed much. He didn't think it ever would poverty-stricken hopelessness. There weren't many ways out of this kind of poor. He had found one, though. He no longer lived in this area of town, but a part of him missed it. He did not miss his parents. He did not miss being punched when they were drunk. He did not miss being kicked when they were high. He did miss some things, however. There had been happy times in this place once. Jexa passed the block of flats where he used to live with his parents. They were gone now. So was the home he knew. He didn't feel too bad about that. It wasn't a very nice home. As a new pang of guilt climbed inside Jex's skull to make its nest, he looked up at the balcony he used to play on as a child. It was rusted and an absolute death trap, but his bedroom window opened onto that balcony. He would hide out there when it got bad. A neighbouring bedroom window opened onto that balcony too. That balcony was where he met her, his first and best friend. And that was long ago, a different time, and that friend was gone now too, though in a different way to his parents. Jexa hurried past the block of flats. His old friend often sat in the balcony they shared as children, and he didn't want her to see him. Especially not after today. It was getting late. The sun was starting to set and was bathing the town in a soft light that did a good job of hiding how abysmally craptastic the place was. Jexa had stayed well after the final school buzzer had sounded. He didn't want to go home until he was calmer. It had taken him quite some time to find his inner peace after that incident in the cafeteria, and he had not left the school until he felt normal. 
odd, one-sided, guilt-induced conversations with himself and strange accents notwithstanding. The part of the town he now walked through was practically deserted, quiet as a grave except for one thing. A small voice that seemed to be ranting wildly about something or other. Jex was strained to hear exactly where the voice was coming from. After a few moments, he located its source. Fred. Walking on the other side of the street, blissfully unaware that she was being observed and deep in an angry conversation. Try as he might, Jex was unable to see who this clearly furious bunny was arguing with. Though it was clear she was arguing with somebody, and she was doing it to a spectacular degree. Fred was ranting, her ears shifting positions upon her head as she spoke, each movement an exclamation point in her clearly imaginary conversation. She would stop every so often and point emphatically at imaginary foes before besting them in her mind, which was clearly a turbulent and improperly formatted kind of place. Jexer imagined that he had a fairly shrewd idea who Fred might have been arguing with in the comforts of her own mind. While he felt vaguely sorry for the fictional version of Anna Marie that was receiving the full force of Fred's venom, he did find that he was very glad that he was not on the receiving end of all of that fluffy vengeance. "'You want a piece of me?' Fred asked the empty space before her as she slapped her palms to her chest repeatedly. "'Yeah, you better run!' Skank. Jexa slapped his hands over his mouth and hid behind a tree as he stifled what was sure to be a badly received guffaw. After a moment, Jexa poked his head out from behind the tree, where he hid, like a coward. He instantly regretted his actions. Fred was staring directly at him from across the street. For a moment, he genuinely feared for his life, such was the intensity of her scowl. Her hands were clenched into fists at her side and her long ears were swept back like a cat who was seconds away from losing its crap. Jexa found his mind dwelling on how embarrassing his epitaph would be. Nobody liked him, and he was beaten to death by the world's most adorable bunny because he watched her mental breakdown and didn't run away when it became clear how deeply and irretrievably unstable she was. Fred's eyes widened as she realised that this boy from her class had witnessed her latest descent into madness. Well, there really was nothing else for it. He, and indeed his entire family line, must be expunged from the face of the earth. It was a simple proposition. He had seen her acting unhinged, so now he had to die screaming. Fred made plans to end the boy, that were probably not going to be acted upon, then decided on another more reasonable option. She would pretend that none of this furry nonsense had happened at all, and walk away as if she was perfectly sound of mind and body. Which is what she did. Fred casually continued walking in the way that perfectly sane people walk, until she rounded the nearest corner. Once safely out of sight, she grabbed both of her ears and used them to cover her mouth as she screamed plaintively in embarrassment. Once that was taken care of, she very carefully identified every memory connected to the tragic event, doused them in gasoline, and lit a match, burning the memories out of her brain for all time. Or until she woke at 3am in a cold sweat to flail with shame in her bed. Whichever came first. I hope you enjoyed today's chapter of Yokai Paper Leaves. If you did, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification icon so that you won't miss a single chapter. This book, as well as all four volumes of the Hieronymus Jones series, is available from my website, www.voodoodelicious.com, as well as Amazon and iTunes. Thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join me next time.